You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, today is officially the day. That came up super fast. I had to double, triple, quadruple check to make sure that that was actually the case. Turns out it is the case. I kind of like that. They should, they should just play twice a week, play Sunday, Thursday. That would make me much happier. Not the Packers. Be a lot more injuries. Be miserable for them. Um, but I demand it. I'm an owner of the team. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> you guys got to stop saying that, by the way. I know I know you're usually joking, but some of you are not joking. So stop it. Please stop it. Anyways, pretty uh, in, in pretty amazing fashion, I want to start off with the uh, prediction here. I was stunned when the Packers were going through their five-game losing streak to find that Tennessee was only a one-point favorite. This had happened two weeks ago, and I had bet on the Tennessee Titans because I thought that was insane. You have a team with a winning record that's allowing offenses to score basically no points. I know their offense is struggling, but one point seemed impossible to me. And so I bet on them. Then we go and beat Dallas, right? And so I understand the sentiment that, you know, you'd look at it and say, hey, the Packers look better. We don't know for sure that they're all the way back, but they certainly look better, and there's a potential that this is a very good Green Bay Packers team. But in my mind, that maybe gets them on the level of where Tennessee already is, and we know that they are. Now, granted, this is in Green Bay. Green Bay is now three-point favorites in this game, which is kind of the punchline here. Three-point favorites. With the Green Bay Packers beating Dallas and Philadelphia losing to Washington, at this point in time, the Eagles are six-and-a-half-point favorites over the Packers. If the Packers beat the Titans, I wouldn't be surprised if that closes. I'm not saying to zero, Philadelphia is going to continue to be favorites, depending on exactly how badly the Packers do beat the Titans, if in fact they do. But I think that's really, I think that really points to how insane the NFL is this season. And and it's a credit to the Packer fans that held on strong and said, hey, nobody's really playing well. It's anybody's race. Because Regardless of the, because re- again, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to happen at all. What I am saying is if the Packers turn it on and the defense improves and the special teams improves, because I, mean, I think it all automatically will, because not only is Amari not there, but we actually have a pretty solid kick returner. I mean, he's, he's not, he's not Devin Hester, but he actually gets a decent chunk of yards and it's, it's looking pretty good. I like our punter. I like our kicker. Hopefully he's doing okay, health-wise. I like a lot of our, our, our gunners and, and or what are they called now? They're uh, flyers. They're gunners. Stupid. Flyer is more accurate, but it doesn't sound as cool. Plus, I'm accustomed to it. But, but let's think about that. The arguably, and I don't know if anybody would have agreed with this, but arguably the best team in football are the Philadelphia Eagles. They just lost to Washington. If the Packers curb stomp the Tennessee Titans, let's say they win by 10 points or more, Let's say Tennessee gets to 10 and the Packers get to, let, 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 let's say more so. Let's say the Packers do get to like 28, 25, 28, regardless of, of what Tennessee does on the other side of it. 
You're talking about a premier defense with an offense that just said, I don't care. We're going to do what we want. We take what we want. At that moment, just off the top of your head, do you know for sure that the Eagles are better? If the offense and defense play well, Tennessee doesn't get to, let's just, let's forget 10. Let's say they don't get to 20. So 19 points. And the Packers get close to 30. Let's say, let's 20 to 30. Okay. 10 point win. Defense did all right. Offense did incredible. Are we positive the Packers aren't already better than the Eagles? Just like that. I'm not positive. Remember, like most teams, the, the Eagle, or like every team um, that has a good record, most of their wins did not come against good teams. Most of their wins came against pathetic teams. Detroit, uh, Washington, the first time they beat them. Jacksonville, Arizona, Pittsburgh, Houston. The only slightly impressive wins were Dallas, who we also beat. And I guess Minnesota week two, and that's about it. And just like with Washington, where Washington beat them 24 to eight, and then the, the, or they, they beat Washington 24 to eight, come back the next week and lose. I don't know for sure that if they play Minnesota again, that they don't end up getting absolutely brutalized. Minnesota's playing real well. Beyond that, it is worth noting, I'm, I'm sticking on Philadelphia. The, the broader point is not Philadelphia, but I'm going to stick on it for just one moment. It is worth noting that getting it, that, first loss can have a pretty major impact on a team. Remember that scene in 300? I was just talking to my wife about 300. She actually said she wants to watch it with me, which shocked me. She's going to hate it, but she's willing, so we're going to do it. Remember that scene in 300 where the arrow grazes his face and the line was something to the effect of, even a god king can bleed? But the relevance of that was he was shocked because he genuinely felt like he couldn't bleed because he thought he was a god. And now he realized he's just a man. I think there's something to that. I think there's been talking about it all season. There, there's the attitude in the locker room matters a lot. You know, people are freaking out about the Colts win. I, I said, I think the Colts are probably going to win. Why? Because they got that new coach and the new coach is, is nothing if he's not a hype guy. That's what he is. He's, he's, he's a great motivator. He's a great leader. That's great. And that's going to that's gonna be that jolt of energy. That's, that's defib paddles just blasting you in the chest. But it doesn't sustain you. So I don't know if it lasts for two weeks, three weeks, whatever. Same, same exact thing I said about Carolina. They had the, the, the new quarterback, the new coach, and man, they, just, they, they played with heart and passion. And man, they just kept on going. They had so much fight. It didn't sustain. I mean, they, they, they beat Atlanta. They beat uh, uh, Tampa. Nearly beat Atlanta a second time, but you're starting to see it already sputter, right? I mean, things clearly got better. They beat Tampa first. Then they took Atlanta to overtime. They got beat pretty bad by Cincy. Then they came back, played Atlanta again, and won. So there's still some kind of energy there, but it's, it's waning. And, and eventually, whatever kind of hype and excitement and everything, it starts to wear off. That works in the opposite sense, too. I remember I talked about this with the uh, Carolina Panthers. The thing that propelled them that year they went to the Super Bowl is the fact that they went undefeated. And they felt undefeated. And Cam is a, is a super emotional player. And so when things are going well, he's going to ride real high. And he was playing out of his mind that year. I've said Cam has, has always been an overrated quarterback, but that was the year he was actually a really solid quarterback. And what he did with his legs and his arm as a combination was, was unstoppable. But when they lost, I mean, you could even see it in the game when he didn't fall on the ball and everything. He was, he was kind of losing heart. He was realizing, like, you know, he, it's... It's, it's as if, uh, you know, you've always had a real good right hook. And every time you've been into a fight, you just knock guys out. You know, you get those real heavy punchers. And then you get that one guy, you hit him and his head doesn't even flinch. He just looks at you like, what are you doing? I, that next punch is not going to have anywhere near as much power. They played, they played the Broncos and there was just, they didn't flinch. And they just kept coming. And they just, it just sapped the energy out of them. And look at how Carolina played the next year. The first game, the first game back, They played the Denver Broncos, and they got brutalized. And I said, after that loss, if they lose to Denver again, considering how emotional that team is and everything else, despite the fact that they were undefeated and went to the Super Bowl, I bet they're going to be like garbage. And they were. Cam played like crap. The entire team played like crap. I'm not even sure if they went to the playoffs that next year. Now, I don't think that's going to happen to the Eagles. I mean, they're they're a good football team, and of course they still believe, but it's going to be, it's it's a big hit, especially when you're talking about a division, divisional opponent you were big time favorites, and you just kind of got embarrassed. And it was an offensive and defensive failure. The offense and defense both kind of collapsed. They only scored 21 points. That's the lowest since week five. 
They gave up 32 points. That's the most since week one when they gave up 35 to the Lions. The offense and the defense fell apart. There were four turnovers in that game. Then you got to factor in the quarterback. You got, you got, you know, some people coming out saying the quarterback is, is overrated. He's not that good. He's a liability. Then you got Eagles fans coming around saying, you guys are psychotic. You're a bunch of idiots. He's great. He's elite. He's dominant. I wasn't even sure why that was happening. I thought it was just because of a loss, and now I see the turnovers. I don't know how many of them were fumbles compared to interceptions, but point is, again, the broader point is that it's not just the records that are close. It's just the, it's the talent levels. The Buffalo Bills, when we started for most of this season, were by far the most dominant team in football. They've lost two in a row. They lost to the Jets, and they lost to the Vikings. And that last loss was at home. They give up 33 points to Minnesota. That is the most they've given up this year. That's the most they've given up since, uh, but, 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 well, Kansas City Chiefs, I guess, in the playoffs. Otherwise, you have to go back to Tampa Bay in the regular season week 14 last year. This is, this is what you don't usually see. In a weird way, it almost seems like offenses are starting to wake up a little bit. We saw the Packers do it. You saw the Bears do it. You're seeing all these teams that are not giving up any points. Suddenly, they're giving up points. Suddenly, offenses are starting to wake up all across the league. It's not just the Chiefs and the Bills. Minnesota. I mean, just through, I mean, pretty much the entire NFC North now are teams that can score points, right? I mean, the Bears, the Lions, the Pack, the Lions have been doing it kind of all year, sporadically, but they started off the season as a, as a top scoring team. And then this past week, 31 points against the Bears. Who would have thought Bears Lions was a 30 to 31 team uh, score? I mean, but uh, I mean the Chiefs they're they're probably the top team, but they haven't their offense is the the main focal point of their team. They scored 20 against the Titans and 27 against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, they did have 44 against the 49ers before that, but then 20 before. So in the last three games, they had one game of 44. Otherwise, it was 20, 20, and 27. It was the defense largely that's been winning it for them. The last several weeks, nobody's gotten to 30 points um, since week four. And it's that was the only game all year. Prior to that was 20, 24, and 21. The only reason their defense isn't looking as spectacular as you would expect based on such low scores is, again, because every defense is doing this. So, again, I'll ask the question, what happens when offenses start to wake up? Kansas City isn't scoring 44 per game. They've done it three times, which is a lot, but 27, 17, 30, 20, 20, and 27. If teams start scoring, let's say, let's get back to the 24 points thing. They've lost three games. If teams start scoring, you know, 28, they've lost five games. You look at Miami, who is now the number one team in their division over the Buffalo Bills. You want to talk about an offense that woke up th- to start the season, 20-42, which is a big one, then 21, 15, 17, 16, 16. That's what they scored on offense. So aside from the 42 in week two against the Ravens, it was 20, 21, 15, 17, 16, 16. The last three weeks, 31, 35, and 39. I don't know what it was that caused offenses to fall asleep this year, but it seems as though the beast is waking up. Now, on the negative side, this is also true in the other direction. Because if it isn't true that the Packers wake up, and dominate and the offense really gets humming and the defense kind of takes a step forward you know because they took a couple steps back they need to start taking a couple steps forward again the the reality is true in the other direction how much better are we than the Jacksonville Jaguars when we're not winning games I mean the last three weeks they're one and two last two weeks they're one and one they've got the 21st ranked offense 12th ranked defense I think both of those might be better marks than our team. I'm not positive. Now, don't feel like looking up because it doesn't really matter, but that's the point. These are terrible three-win teams. Cleveland, similarly, they won, they're won. they 1-1 and one the last two weeks, just like the Packers are. The one week, there was 17-39, to 39, which is embarrassing. The other one was 32-13. to 13. They just crushed a team. By the way, not super great uh, to look at that kind of a situation where you see they played the Cincinnati Bengals. 32-13, you say, all right, we're, we're, we're back. It's go time. We're doing this. The next week, they get crushed 39-17. to Same as the Jaguars, right? Hey, we're back on track. 27-20, here we go. The next week, they lose 17-27. Steelers, last two weeks, they're 1-1. One and one. How much better are we than the Steelers when we're at our worst? So again, it, it's not just the record. This, if they 
prove that this past week was a bit of a fluke. And Rodgers starts to struggle a little bit. Maybe it's his thumb bugging him, whatever. The receivers start running into each other again and, and dropping balls, which Christian, he can continue to drop passes. I don't really care. As long as he catches about, you know, 60% of them, uh, I'll, I'll get over it. <laughs> he said still a lot. Um, but, you know, the, the offensive line has some issues. The defense continues to collapse. Special teams, every time we think is fixed, is not. You know, those, start, those things start to creep up. We are right in line with the worst teams in football, which we knew that the pre- previous week, and that remains true. But again, the biggest difference, or the biggest thing to remember, is that it's, it's also true. I mean, how many teams are better than the Packers if they win this? I mean, you could say, okay, you got um, Eagles, Vikings, Chiefs, Ravens. I mean, it's not Tennessee because we would have just beat them, right? That's a six and three team, just like Baltimore is. Maybe, maybe the Ravens, but the Ravens' offense is not good. They're ranked fourth overall, but that's because they scored thirty-eight and thirty-seven in weeks two and three. They haven't done jack squat since. Would have said the Bills if they didn't just drop two in a row. So, without question, top five team, arguably top three, and we got to see how these things shake out. I mean, we're going to go toe to toe with the Eagles. That'll give us a, a real clear uh, picture of, of where it is we stand on things. That'll be two teams kind of battling for that number two spot behind maybe the Kansas City Chiefs. Sorry to the Vikings for not giving, being given the opportunity, but it is what it is. You already had your shot against the Eagles, and you lost. So, Anyways, again, I just wanted to point that out because, again, Packers are three-point favorites. Despite being as bad as they've been all year, they are three-point favorites against a six-win Tennessee Titans team that is number one in their division. They are currently six and a half point underdogs against the Eagles. I'll be really interested to, interested to see if the Packers win. What happens to that line? That, of course, is if they win. But there is another question, and that is why is it, in this particular case, against the Tennessee Titans, why is it the Packers are favorites? I want to look at Tennessee and um, ask the question based on as bad as the Packers have been. Because remember, this isn't just a matter of while well, they won against Dallas. They were one-point favorites against Green Bay prior to us beating them. Where is this lack of confidence coming from? Why don't we take a break here? I know it's early, but I want to uh, just get it out of the way so we can keep rocking and rolling. Please consider giving, uh, if you're interested, at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Also, please consider giving to Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. You can find out more about them at FertileGroundRanch.org. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. So I want to start with this, because remember, the Packers are favorites in this game, right? And so there's, there's a couple reasons a team would be a favorite. Number one, the um, team that is the favorite is, is good. Number two, the team that is the underdog is bad, and there's a varying combination in between, where do we stand on things? I'll start with just a couple clips. We're not going to get super in-depth about it, but just to kind of give you a, a sense of what I've been seeing, hearing, whatever. Here's the first clip. It's from The Volume, which is Colin Coward's show. He's got his own YouTube show called The Volume, and he has guests on or whatever. Um, this is, who is this even that's on here? I'm not even entirely sure. People don't really utilize, I know I don't utilize comment sections, so I can't really talk, but Nobody anymore uses comments, or not comment sections, the descriptions, to uh, do anything useful whatsoever. Every time I look, like, what is that? They don't say anything. It's always a copy-paste thing, which, again, is what I do, but whatever. Anyways, point is, no idea who this guy is. But here's just him kind of generally talking about the game. Um, we've been huge Dak supporters over the years. Ed and I really liked him, even coming out of the college and, and all that kind of thing. But, boy, when you... When you put that kind of performance out there and then you watch Rodgers, who's been down this year, and he's got his own thumb injury and, and how efficient he was. And, and you would throw a guy, you know, you need a quarterback to take you to a different level and maybe help you win that game. And he throws 46 times, two picks. We can blame that on some of the receivers or whatever. But, I mean, you can't be late. You can't be throwing in the middle of the, the end zone. So I, I would say always the quarterback is is the biggest uh, point of contention 
when it comes to the Cowboys and really anywhere in the league. But this particular quarterback, and, and you've seen it in in talking about Dak, um, the fact that you're not a, the biggest Dak. It's not that you can't don't like the guy or think he's a good player, but the fact that you don't have him as a top ten quarterback. Um, some people label, well, he, he's a Dak hater kind of deal. Anyways, you get the idea, right? All right, so that's that's one clip. By the way, the title of this podcast or this show is Blame Dak Prescott for Dallas Cowboys' Rough Loss to the Green Bay Packers. There's a question mark there, but whatever. That's That's the question they're trying to ask and answer. And then they go on to have a discussion based on losing to the Packers, to something to the effect of, you know, is is he declining? Young versus young Dak versus old Dak. How does he stack up against other quarterbacks? The point is, we're they're using this as a launching off point to say that Dak Prescott is really not that good of a quarterback. Or at least that's what Colin Coward appears to be doing. All right, I got another one for you. No, <laughs> the question is, is it sustainable? I know Aaron doesn't like the word, but it seems like a pretty reasonable question to me. Can is that the formula? For that team, they need to win. They're in the playoffs now. Right? Yeah, they basically yeah. need to win every game, and Tennessee isn't easy for anybody. Can yeah. they do that to the Titans tomorrow night? Well, Aaron Rodgers needs to pipe down. He's being too loud. But here's the thing. <laughs> I do think there is a potential for this to be the formula that they replicate down the stretch. Now, I don't think they're going to have much success against the Titans, but they'll have opportunities against yeah. teams that are on their schedule in the back half. But would you- All right. So then there's that. So, so far we've heard... The summary of the Dallas Cowboys game is that Dak lost the game against the Packers. Now on ESPN, we're hearing, you know, hey, and, and by the way, I'm hearing this on multiple shows that I'm, I'm combing through. What they did last week is the formula. Rodgers needs to do less, run the ball, etc. But the key point, I don't think they're going to have much success against Tennessee. By the way, the, the overarching theme for a lot of these other shows that I'm not playing because it doesn't really... It's not really relevant to what we're talking about is I have no idea. So, so there's no real just general confidence for the Packers. It's, you know, I don't know. We'll see if they can continue to do this. Will they stick to this game plan? Can they be consistent? Right. That's, that's the question. But where is the confidence coming from that says the Packers will beat the Titans? I've heard one guy say they only beat Dallas because of, because of Dak sucking. One guy say they won't beat the Titans. Why are we three-point favorites? Well, we're home, whatever. Okay, forget, forget the three-point. Why is it even even? Here's another clip. It's just it's in a random starting spot because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't need to be perfect. I just want you to hear the, the main crux of it. This is Dan Hanses. His whole thing over at NFL Network is power rankings. He's the power ranking guy. Brings on Stacey Dales. Here's them talking. With you, and here we are. Uh, finally, <laughs> man, you love yourself some Chicago Bears and Green Bay Packers. Like the Packers win one game and you thrust them up I six know. spots. You know what? I think maybe that's a little high, but I think what you're saying, I like the first part of what you were saying better that there are many imitators in the power rankings game, but there, there's only <laughs> one uh, old Zeus or power rankings. I think, why don't we start? Mm-hmm. What, let's get, let's start with the Packers. All right. So you. Okay. When I watch that game, and I and I know Aaron Rodgers talks and talks and talks, so maybe we get to a point where you don't have to, you could tune him out. But when he went on the McAfee show and made the comment, uh, you know, people forget that I'm the reigning back-to-back MVP. Um, and then I was like, man, this is, feels like a spot where the Packers are going to put up a big fight and maybe turn their season around. And then they do it against the Cowboys. I guess I'm buying in a little bit, but that we might see a, a push for this team now, and they are in consideration for the playoffs, which is why they cracked the top 16. Play that last part just to uh, get it in there that they did jump six spots, but they're just inside the top 16 right now. Barely top half. And remember who's on the bottom half. It's really bad. Here's uh, CBS talking about the Titans Packers game. Again, I'm just waiting to hear. Packers, <laughs> I don't know. Game, and then they follow that up with another big win. You think the Packers do that too? Short week tends to benefit the home team. Uh, it was nice to see Christian Watson finally come around, become the player that they drafted him to be. There's one glaring issue with this matchup, and that's Derrick Henry and the fact that this Packers defense cannot stop the rushing attack, in particular of a guy like Derrick Henry. So uh, I, don't know how, I, don't, I don't know how good the Packers are right now. I really don't. I'm not sure what to take away from from that win 
Um, it could be a turning point for them, or it might be nothing. And I think in this case, I probably need to see in back-to-back weeks. I'm going to take the three points and the Tennessee Titans in this one. I'm not saying, obviously, that the Titans win this game, but I do think it's going to be a close game because of the- All right, so, again, there, there, there is no, con- regardless of, of the three points, there's no confidence in the Packers. There is, there is understanding that potentially this is a turnaround, but there is no definitive, man, the Packers are really going to be good. They're going on a run. They're going to beat the Titans because they are a good team better than the Titans. So all that to say, as I said earlier, there's one of two ways you're a favorite in the game, either because you're a good team or because they're a bad team. And when you look at their 6-3 and three record, it's hard to comprehend how they could be seen as not just a bad team, but underdogs against the Packers. Well, let's take a look at the uh, let's take a look at the Tennessee Titans and see if we can parse this out. There's a couple things. Number one, injuries. Now the Packers got a bunch of them too, so it doesn't 100% uh, work out. But I want to talk about the the injuries either way for both teams. First of all, both teams are extensive. You got to scroll quite a bit to get from one team to the next. Um, Right now, kicker Randy Bullock did not practice Monday or Tuesday. Bud Dupree, pass rusher, who I don't believe played last week, did not practice uh, Monday or Tuesday. Cody Hollister, wide receiver, didn't practice Monday or Tuesday. Lonnie Johnson, defensive back, did not practice Monday or Tuesday. Ben Jones did not practice Monday or Tuesday. You've also got a few other injuries. Uh, Players that were limited this past game, Jeffrey Simmons, who did not play, uh, last week, didn't participate on Monday, limited on Tuesday. Uh, Roger McCreary, cornerback, limited. And uh, everybody else is full participant, but that includes quarterback Ryan Tannehill has an ankle injury. Kevin Strong, defensive lineman, uh, has an ankle injury. Elijah Molden, defensive back, ankle injury. David Long, linebacker, neck injury. Amani Hooker, safety, shoulder injury. Derek Henry, running back. Uh, it was just veteran rest, but whatever. Veteran rest. Isn't he like 26? Um, Christian Fulton, cornerback, hamstring injury. Uh, Aaron Brewer, outside linebacker, on our, or excuse me, <laughs> offensive line. I'm not sure what position. Uh, toe injury. And then did, did, did Denico. Is it Denico or Denico? Autry. I should know that. He also had veteran rest. But again, very, uh, very, very extensive. But again, that doesn't quite account for it. David Bakhtiari hasn't practiced all week. Devondre Campbell hasn't practiced all week. Romeo Dobbs, Shamar Jean Charles, Elton Jenkins with a knee injury hasn't practiced all week. Now, we already know, obviously, that uh, Romeo is not going to play, and uh, I don't believe Devondre is going to play. I guess I don't 100% know. David Bakhtiari, I think there's a good chance he doesn't play. Don't know, I'm just saying. So um, we shall see. Bunch of limiteds, Razul, Kingsley, Aaron Jones, Alan Lazard, Keyshawn Nixon, Aaron Rodgers, John Runyon, Preston Smith, Chris, uh, well, Christian was full, but full participant, also injured, Devontae Wyatt, Christian Watson, uh, Mason Crosby, Chris Barnes. So in my mind, they kind of cancel each other out. I want to play for you because, again, I think, I think it's possible to look at records or look at a team and, and not really fully understand. Even if Tennessee didn't have a great record, it's hard to know exactly what's going on over there. Right? You, you could look at the Packers record and not really fully understand what's going on um, in terms of heart and drive. You could look at it and say the, the Packers beat Dallas, but maybe you don't feel confident about it. I do because of what happened. But the point is, there's a lot of context behind everything. I want to play this for you. It's a, uh, it's a pretty short video. I might just play the whole thing, I guess. I don't know, but it's a two-minute video. Um, this is uh, the Action Network sport, Sports Betting Picks Picks and Tips, presented by FanDuel. Um, This is on the Titans and Packers matchup, obviously. Tennessee Packers, it's just, Brable is a dog. I mean, last week, again, they had no right winning or covering that game. They had four of their top defenders out. Uh, Tannehill doesn't look right still. They got no receiving weapons. Even Derrick Henry did not have a good game. Two plays. They made two plays, and they won 17-10. to 10. And That's Rabel. Like, he's just an incredible coach. So that little piece right there, again, is just kind of an insight into, let's say, Titans fans or whatever, people that have been watching the Titans. What you're seeing is a team that just, they look off. In other words, despite their record, 
the way that you talk about the Titans when you watch the Titans is very similar to how people have been talking about the Packers. The quarterback doesn't look right. They have no wide receiver weapons. Even the running backs having a hard time getting going. They have a lot of defensive injuries. They are the Packers. <laughs> they are exactly the Packers. I don't, I don't necessarily mean the post-Dallas Cowboys Packers, because I'm not even sure what that is, but you described them prior to this game against, against Dallas, and that's exactly the same thing you're saying. And so essentially what you have is a, a talented defense that has serious injury concerns and an offense that has just generally questions. Um, again, the, there's the lack of wide receiver weapons, which is a solid thing, right? That's just a thing that exists. Then you've got Tannehill playing poorly, similar to Rodgers playing poorly, where it's like, we know he's capable of, of doing better than this, but he's not. And it's just kind of off. And then Henry is, is he's the guy. That's just, that's the offense. But he even had a bad week last week. It's not to say he's going to have a bad week this week. In fact, most people probably assume he won't against this Packers defense, which is sickening to have to say. I feel it's, it's not surprising because it's a Packers defense and they can never stop the run. But you just thought, you know, maybe they would take a step. But they're going backwards. Anyways, but that's to say the Titans, if I may be corny, are not exactly Titans, despite their record. And I know it's not the best record in the world. Six and three is, is moderately okay, but it's a, it's a solid record. But they're not Giants. They're not Titans. They're just another team, like most teams that are kind of floundering. And in their case, they're finding ways to win games, primarily because their defense is, is doing such a good job of preventing other teams from scoring. But they're not a team that you watch and say that they've really got it together, like the Titans of the last several years, just like, you know, the Packers over the last several years, or many teams over the last several years, they're they're struggling to find their stride. Anyways, let me let me play one more quick thing just to drive the point home here. This is Stephen A. Smith. I don't usually go to Stephen A. because I think he's just a, a goofball, but um whatever. It's 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 a general sentiment. Again, I'm 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 cruising through all these things and and it's almost identical. The only thing you'll find is some people saying, you never know, they could possibly go on a run here, but it's not they will or I think they will. It's they could, and that's crazy, right? We had the same record when we went on the, uh, what is it? I think we can run the table. So that was kind of brought up. But generally, it's between calm down, they won one game, and I'm not sure. They could go either way. Here is what Stephen A. Smith had to say. Three Bay Packers over the previous five weeks, scored 22 points or less. And because they have one game against the Dallas Cowboys, okay, now we're suddenly supposed to believe they've arrived, they've turned the corner. In their last, what is it, seven games of this year, four games are against Tennessee, Philadelphia, Miami, and Minnesota. I don't think they win three of those games. I don't think they win four of those games. I think that at the most, they'll win two of those games, and they already got six losses, which means that's about eight losses. And I can't rule out a road game at Chicago, okay, is, is, a, is a given, you know, or end of the season game against the Detroit Lions, who will have nothing to lose. I can't rule that out. So I look at them and I say, excuse me, they lost five straight. See, this is the part that makes me sick about the Cowboys. Okay, the Cowboys ain't won a damn Super Bowl since 1995. All right, they got a decent, they got a damn good defense, you know, for the most part. They got a decent offense for the most part. They got a winning record. They're gonna make the playoffs, but they ain't won a Super Bowl. Okay, in 26 years, 27 years and counting. All right, but because they lost, they the, the Green Bay Packers beat them. <laughs> Oh, my Lord, have they turned the corner? Have they arrived? I mean, if things are going to get better. Uh, I, I mean, cry me. Are you kidding me? This is the reason that we're supposed to believe that the Green Bay Packers with Matt LaFleur, Listen. with Aaron Rodgers having a great... You get the point. The point is, nobody knows what's going on. Everybody has the same opinion, and many don't really believe in the Packers. They're not favorites over the Titans because people buy in. Again, this has been a thing for a while that they nobody has believed in the Titans, and, and it's supposedly going to be a very close game. Um, even before we beat Dallas, they were, again, one-point favorites. This game is wildly important for the Packers. 
I, I know it's going to sound like I'm just trying to overhype things or, or be overly dramatic or whatever, but this is... Think how much that game against Dallas... Think, think how that felt. Why is it, as I look back, I'm looking at that saying, that felt... I haven't felt that way since the last time when we beat Dallas in the playoffs and the uh, Des didn't catch it game. That's about the last time I, I've, I've felt this way about a game. There was a certain magic to it. This game is pivotal for a lot of reasons. If they lose, I think the season is over. It's not officially over. They're not officially out. But I think it's over. I mean, if they lose, that's seven losses already. That's a lot of losses. And then we play the Eagles. That's probably eight. Even if we go undefeated, we're 10 and eight. On top of that, if you lose this game... It matters because everybody will be able to say, whether it's right or not, everyone will look back and say, ah, it was a fluke. It was a fluke. Dallas choked, right? It was just a good matchup for the Packers. They've been wanting to see single high defense. They finally saw it. They finally attacked it with Christian Watson because he's finally healthy and they finally want to use him. And they have a terrible run defense. You can run all over them and they're stacking the box. So you got easy, you can run the ball easily because their run defense sucks. You can pass the ball easily because they're playing single high defense and you can just shred them with Christian Watson. So it was a perfect matchup for the Packers. And it was at home, it was at Lambeau. Rodgers was feeling better as far as his accuracy is concerned. So everything kind of worked out, even though the defense was bad and special teams was kind of a disaster. Um, those two things were in the offense's favor, so they were able to look good. Now you go up against Tennessee, you look like you did against the Lions. Now we have our answer. If you beat Tennessee, the run is officially on. It's not promised that we're going to win anything, but if you beat Dallas and Tennessee, suddenly you're number one looking at it saying, okay, that wasn't just a fluke. That doesn't mean they're going to beat every single team, but they clearly turned a corner. You, you lose five in a row after barely beating New England a, a, and Bailey Zappi in overtime. After barely beating Tampa Bay by two points the week before that, the only convincing win was against the Chicago Bears, 27-10. to 10. The entire season, up until Dallas, when you're down 14 points in the fourth quarter and win that game. I know it was a three-point win, but it's a convincing win. And everybody that watched it could see that that is a different football team. If you can do that again against Tennessee, again, I'm not necessarily talking point margin. It should be. I mean, it could be. That would be nice as, as far as driving the point home, that this is, this is real. But you know it when you see it. Anyways, a couple of quick hitters here before we get out of here. Um, the new injury report is finally out. So officially, Devondre Campbell is out, as expected. David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins are both questionable. Shamar Jean Charles is doubtful to play. Uh, nobody else is listed as anything. Well, Romeo Dobbs is out, but that's, that's obvious. For the Titans, this is kind of, uh, kind of big. There's a lot of outs here. Kicker Randy Bullock is officially out. He has a right calf injury. I don't exactly know the situation as far as, I mean, obviously they're going to bring in a kicker, but um, how that impacts the game in terms of field goals, I think there might be situations where you have long field goals, they decide to go for it, which is unfortunate in my opinion, but that or punting, I guess, but um, who knows? We'll see how that affects the game. Bud Dupree is also officially out. As I mentioned, I believe he was out last week as well. They still were able to generate a ton of pressure, still a good defense, but they do have some uh, defensive pieces that are out. Looks like he's been dealing with injuries kind of a lot uh, this year. 2020, uh, 2015 first round pick. Uh, he has 16 pressures and three sacks on the season, so pretty solid numbers, uh, slightly above 10% there, but only played six games so far this season. 137 attempts, 16 pressures. Um, did play week seven, eight, nine, not the last two weeks though. He's a outside linebacker, if I didn't say that already. Uh, in addition to that, Amani Hooker, the safety, is out with a shoulder injury. He was That's surprising. He was a full participant Monday and Tuesday, limited Wednesday, and officially out for the game. Um, he's also had some injury issues, kind of similar, actually. Played weeks one, two, and three, and then was out. Came back, played weeks seven and eight, and has been out ever since. Again, I was a little surprised because it didn't sound serious. Usually when you're a full participant, you're fine, but... Uh, apparently they decided to shut him down again. Very good football player. Um, he's got a 72 overall grade. Last year he had an 86 overall grade when he actually played the full season. Um, 
despite hardly any playing time, he's already got a pick and a pass breakup, 61.8 passer rating when targeted. So um, pretty key piece for the defense that's not going to be playing. Lonnie Johnson is also out with a hamstring. He's another uh, safety for the Tennessee Titans. I believe he is a backup, but I don't 100% know that. Imani Hooker and Kevin Byard are typically your number one and two, and according to our lads, he's like third string, but yet he does have a decent amount of playing time. Anyways, he's also going to be out. And then finally, their starting center, Ben Jones, will also be out. This one is a pretty big blow because it's new. Um, He's been playing pretty much all season, played the last several weeks. 78 run blocking grade, 60 pass blocking grade. Not the greatest in the world, but that's that's some production there, especially as a run blocker for a team that, you know, leans on the run to be a pretty premier run blocking center um, and a, a longtime player. I mean, the guy's 33 years old. He's played with Tennessee since 2016. And before that, he was with Houston for four years. So um, the guy's got, what, six, seven, 11 years? Um, according to PFF, they're projecting Corey Levin to come in and play. Corey Levin, um, his grades over three years, he's a six-round pick uh, from 2017. In the three years that he's played, 2018 through 2022, 54, 52, and 54 are his overall grades. Uh, kind of the polar opposite of um, of Ben Jones, seemingly a, 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 at least very small sample size, but uh, slightly competent pass blocker, terrible run blocker. But um, that one's going to be a bit of a blow for a team that's offense is really having a hard time gelling. Um, So that is the final injury report prior to the game. Last couple notes here. Matt Schneidman says, Matt LaFleur said Kylan Hill's release is more about off the field stuff than on it. Said being a Packer is a privilege and you have to be supportive of others in your role, no matter how big or small. I like this because what did I say was about to happen? Now, Granted, I thought it was going to happen after we lost a game. But you're starting to, in my opinion, see the pruning, right? Amari cut. Remind, it actually very much reminds me of what we did in 2018. If you remember, in 2018, we had a similar situation with a special teams player that um, was not doing a good job, and Gutekunst came in and cut him. The guy's name was Ty Montgomery. This year, the guy's name was Amari Rogers. On top of that, there's another character guy that got cut. Again, in 2018, it was the same thing. Feels like Gutekunst is coming in and saying, this guy's a problem, that guy's a problem, enough is enough. We've got Amari cut, and we've got a character issue that has now been removed from the team. I don't know the the situation or what exactly that means, but saying that it has to do with off-the-field stuff and not on it and, and not being supportive of others kind of tells me what I need to know. Anyways, I found this also very interesting. Clayton pointed me to this. Uh, Dusty Evely on Twitter posted a couple little statistics. And essentially, it's offensive production with and without Christian Watson. I know this is very Christian Watson intensive. You're going to have to get used to that. Um, If he completely falls off a cliff, then eventually this will all sizzle and people can jump up and say, remember when you were so stupid? Yeah, I get it. But it is interesting. And, and and as I've said, it was funny because I was listening to, I think it was the Draft Dudes podcast, and they did a recap of Christian Watson, and it wasn't necessarily super flattering. Essentially, the core of it was he didn't do anything in this game that we said he wouldn't be able to do coming out of college back when we had all our concerns. In other words, all those concerns are still there. He didn't do anything super special. He ran vertical routes really fast, and he caught the passes. And you know what? I agree. And I've always said that. I've always said this guy at this point, I'm not saying he he does or doesn't have the potential because I don't know what his potential is in terms of developing the rest of his game. I actually watched, I think it was Keyshawn Johnson, uh, another video I was watching. He was mocking Christian Watson as a former receiver. And it's funny because he's he's not refined. You know, he's on TV and all these guys are real refined and all the stuff they, they say, but he's a football player and he's just a dude. And Keyshawn Johnson's talking about, I, I don't like him. I don't, I don't, or something like, he's like, I don't like the way he runs. He runs weird. It's like his hands are all flapping around. It's not tight. He said, I, and I don't like his hand. The way he catches a pass, even that, that pass that he caught over his ha- head, it wasn't like, you know, your arms are supposed to be tight and you catch it in your hands. And he's, he's got his arms spread out and it's almost like he's catching it with his forearms. And if you go back and watch it, he's not wrong. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news. So don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event. Us Days. 
What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. It's only a kick, a jump, a block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle, a run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. But I understand that. And I don't think it matters because this is his floor. His floor is opening up this entire offense with his speed. Because as I said, you, you not only stretch the field vertically, you stretch the field horizontally with his speed. That third touchdown pass was him running across the formation. You have to be able to cover sideline to sideline, and we have to cover a little bit deeper. Right? It's kind of like when you're playing baseball, and depending on who's hitting, you either come up or you move back. Yeah, what you want to do is you want to move him back. Now stretch the field as much as you possibly can, and he does. He stretches the field. That's without him catching a single pass. Then you add on to that his ability to run deep routes. That's his floor. So I'm, I'm fine saying he is a very raw, unrefined product and, and may just be a one-trick pony in this offense and just be a flash in the pan and never be like that elite, you know, 1,500-yard, 15-touchdown receiver. Maybe. I don't know. But if this is as bad as it gets, I can live with it. And again, a lot of it has to do not just with his direct contribution, but what does he do for the rest of the guys when he's on the field? But I want to look at a, at a couple different stats that he put here. How many yards on average does the team accumulate per drive? Well, the, the team average this year, yards per, uh, yards per drive, net yards per drive, is 32.9 yards per drive on average. Without Christian Watson, it's 30.6 yards, as you would expect, because Christian Watson hasn't been on the field a ton this year, so it's probably going to be pretty close to that average. You know what it is when he's on the field? 40.5 yards per drive. You think, well, that's not that big of a difference. 30.6 to 40.5 is 10 yards. Wow, so we got from the 40 to the 50. Do you know what the number one offense in football is? It's the Kansas City Chiefs. You know who's number one in yards per drive? It's the Kansas City Chiefs. Do you know how many yards they get per drive? 40.5. The exact same number as what we get with Christian Watson. Points per drive is not quite as impressive. Average points per drive, the Green Bay Packers right now are sitting at um, 24th, 1.65 points per drive. When Christian Watson is not on the field, we score 1.24 points per drive when he is 1.9. Again, not quite as impressive. The Kansas City Chiefs, again, number one in this metric, are at 2.81, almost a full point ahead of us, even with Christian Watson on the field. Another major metric here, the Packers have scored a touchdown on 26.5% of the drives with Christian Watson, 15.7% of the drives that he has not been a part of. That is an unbelievably large disparity. 157 compared to 26.5. We're talking 11% more. Here's, here's another way he phrased this. Put another way, the Packers have had 21 touchdown drives this season. 13 of those, which is 61.9%, had Christian Watson on the drive. 
he's only played 26.6% of offensive snaps. He's only played about a quarter of the snaps that we've been on the field. But he accounts for, not by himself, but his presence has accounted for 62 point, uh, 62% of all scoring drives. That's remarkable. He goes on to say, if we want to expand that to all scoring drives, the Packers have had 31 total scoring drives this year, 21 touchdowns and 10 field goals. Watson contributed to 18 of those, 58.1, while again being on the field for 26.6% of the total snaps. We have the secret sauce, folks. We just need consistency. And that's offense and defense. We have what we need. We don't need anything else. The fact that we're sitting here going, I don't know if we can beat the Titans. I don't know about the Eagles. I don't know about the Lions. I don't even know about the Bears. It's pathetic. And I'm not saying it's pathetic that I'm saying it. It's pathetic that I have to say it. We shouldn't be talking about it. We shouldn't have all these losses. We shouldn't be talking about one more loss and we're done. We have what we need to be the number one offense. We have it. So uh, we got to figure it out. And and it's got to be quick. And and maybe we did. Maybe we got to figure it out. But but again, this is a tough test. This is a different kind of test. This is tough run defense. And that that you you can't have that thing that's going to completely shut you down. So the bottom line is when when they say we're we're not you can only guard one door, right? They lock both doors, and then they put a guard on one of the doors. Now, if you're, in this case, we're talking run defense, pass defense. In this case, the Titans are going to lock one door, which is run defense, but they're going to lock and guard the other door, which is pass defense, and they're going to say, I don't think you can kick down that door. You have to be able to kick through those locks, that being the unguarded but locked Tennessee Titans defensive front, run defense. If you can kick through that door, they may have to move the guard over. Then you can freely kick the other door open, which isn't locked as well because their pass defense is not as good as their run defense. Or you say, even with the extra help, I think we can get through the guard and that garbage door that's barely even dead bolted. But that's what makes really good offenses really good offenses. It's not that we have this, this sort of good combination of running and then you know using that to, to pass. Because then you just have one path, and if we interrupt that first step, it all falls apart. You know, running the ball is like, if you're grilling, it's your charcoal. It's like, we got, we got the charcoal, we got this beautiful grill, we got the wood chunks, mm, some apple wood, we got a beautiful ch- piece of meat, and we got it seasoned up real nice. It's all brined up, juicy. You, you, you can't stop this. It's, it's the most, it's going to be the best piece of meat you've ever eaten in your tri- entire life. And I walk up and take your charcoal away and say, now what are you going to do? Oh. Uh, I don't know. What do you do? You're done. That's the point. You can't have that thing. You got to have a plan B. You, you have to be strong. If you, if you take away the run against Kansas City, first of all, the, the, the first thing you do is say you're not taking that away, but you have to have that complement. And again, that's going to be the test. And I, and I hope we don't abandon it. I hope that if they're going to play light up front that we say I, that's, that was stupid and we smash them in the mouth over and over again with the run. And just let them know this ain't the same team that you've been playing all year. I know everybody else has been running away from you and playing scared of your defensive front. We're not going to do that. We're not that team. You don't understand what you're dealing with right here. And if you don't put an extra man in this box fast, you're going to be on this field all day. That's step one. If you can do that, it's game over. They're done. They're cooked. If you can't, it's not to say that it's game over, but we're in drop back, spread them out. Try to pass against a you know tough defense with a with a good pass rush, and you start seeing uh, you know the, you know how it goes. I don't need to explain it to you. All I know is every time we've seen the Packers not look good, that's the that's the mode they're in. All right, forget running; it ain't working, boys. Spread them out. Let's go. We got this. I'm getting the shotgun. I'm gonna spread this out. I'm gonna send some signals. I'm watching this. D- oh, 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 I caught this over here. Hey, check, 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 Mason, check, Mason. Pain train's coming. It's a disaster. But that's, that's the question, and we're going to find out. And if, if we can't, then fine, right? A, a lot of this has been about learning this team anyways. So, okay, we thought maybe we'd have a comeback. We did not have a comeback, but we still learned some really awesome things. And we learned that there is this one thing we can't quite do, 
And that is if they have the ability to win up front, we lose. All right, what do we got to do? Get some offensive linemen. I think that would be the best thing you can do. Get stronger up front. Or go the other route. Do what the Packers have traditionally always done, especially if we're keeping Aaron Rodgers. You know Rodgers would love this plan. We're going to stack up with receivers, whether that's tight ends or, or wide receivers, so that I don't care if you have a light box so that you can play you know, nickel or dime or, or penny, dollar, half dollar, tree fitty. Whatever defense you want to put out there, it doesn't matter. We're going to carve it up because we got the receivers. We got Watson. We got Dobbs. We got this new guy, new young X slot, Z, X, Y, killer combo. You know what I'm talking about. Just going just gonna to snatch your soul. But you got to have that bunker buster. And, I, and that's what I'm curious to see this week. We saw a team that was a bad matchup. I mean, a good matchup for us, a bad matchup for them. We were able to take advantage of it. That's awesome. Do we have a bunker buster? Do we have a, a run offense that can bust through this defense? Do we have the receivers and the quarterback, if they're at their peak, that can play against this team, even if they're, you know, got extra DBs out? At least that's how I think these things are going to pan out. We shall see. But that's primarily what I'm watching for. Defense, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, play better would be nice. Again, bad matchup. It, it just is. They're, they, they've got a great run defense and a good running offense, and that's just a bad matchup for us. And if we can win this, there's no reason to believe that we, can, we can't beat anybody else because this is one of the worst matchups we're going to see. Anyways, I was, I was thinking about doing a point prediction as well. Well, I'll, 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 I don't know. I'm going to do one. I'm just trying to think the best way to do it because DVOA is not great right now. I'll tell you what I'm going to do because I forgot to do this. Let's end with this. I'll do a point prediction at the end, but I forgot about this. I went to Patreon and I asked for their thoughts on the game. You know, what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. Let me read through these. We've got four of them. Mike, a.k.a. Packers Superfan, says, I have the Packers winning this game prior to the season. Had the Packers winning this game prior to the season. Was going to pick against them prior to the Cowboy game, but now I have no idea what to think. But here goes. If Matt and 12 stick to similar game plan as used in Cowboy game, they win. But if they go back to shotgun hero ball, they will lose. It's their choice. I have no confidence they will do the right thing. Titans 17, Packers 10. It's funny, Keyshawn Johnson actually talked about this, and and I think a lot of other people have too, about the Packers discovered how they need to play football. I know Keyshawn specifically talked about this because the... The other guy, um, I don't know who he was, but he was talking and said, well, which which offenses do you trust more, the Bears or the Packers? And um, he said, well, the Packers, because the Packers win. The Bears score points, but they don't win, which doesn't really make sense because it's mostly the defense, but whatever. And so the other guy says, well, the Packers lose too. And he said, no, 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 no. The Packers changed the way that they play offense this past week. They found the formula. And he actually did some kind of a study or whatever about quarterbacks essentially being more game manager-ish. You need to run the ball and be efficient as a quarterback. We don't need 50-some-odd passes from you. I know you can do it. I know you got the talent. You got all that stuff. That's not what's going to win us football games right now. We need to run the ball, and we need to be selective with our passes. And when it's your time to, to throw the ball, we just need some some intelligent, sharp, crisp passes. That's the formula for success. That's what the Packers did. That's why they won. Mike here thinks that that's the formula. I agree that that's generally the form. It's not not every single week. Things differ, things change. But generally, I think that is somewhat the identity of this team. And it, it is the way that this, this offense operates. Everything kind of looks the same. They all look like, all the run plays look like pass plays, pass plays look like we just have plays. And sometimes we run out of those plays, sometimes we pass out of those plays. And what we actually do as far as if we run, how we run, and if we pass, how we pass, are, there, there's a billion different options. But in this game in particular, I generally tend to agree. And, and, and my concern also, just like with Mike, is that he's saying he has no confidence they're going to do the right thing. My fear is this is a team that sort of discovered the ability to run more often. I think it was like two-thirds of the plays were run plays, one-third were pass plays, something to that effect, something you never thought you'd see the Packers do. But again, now you go up against Tennessee, and every other team that has played Tennessee has said, let's just not run and let's pass. I have a hard time believing Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers go into this and be like, let's be one of the few teams that goes run heavy against them. Let's be one of the few teams that commits to the run and does it successfully. 
I think they come into the game similarly to everybody else and say the weakness of this team is their pass defense. The strength of their team is their run defense. We need to throw the ball. So now that doesn't mean they won't be able to succeed. Maybe they will. But I think most people, if you told most Packer fans that their head was kind of slump and go, oh, crap, here we go. Andrew says tough game with the Packers winning 27-24 run game struggles, but Watson opens up the passing game for all involved. And Hill looks good with the Packers stack in the box, but a key interception makes the difference. And I, and I like the way he phrased that again. It's Watson opens up the passing game for all involved. Because again, it's not just, that's that's the, the great thing about him. And it's the reason, again, Matt LaFleur and Gutekunst have been so obsessed with finding speed. And I almost thought it was annoying. Like, you know, I get it. You like traits, guys, but come on. But again, you look at a guy like Tyree Kill, and no, I'm not comparing him. There are certain things that make Tyree Kill unguardable. And, and some of it is just his flat out speed. Again, I remember watching a Chiefs game the one time, and and it was, if you press him or even get close to him, he's going to get behind you. Because his speed is so unbelievably blinding, they had guys standing 10 or more yards away from him. And when they did that, they would just throw a quick screen, and he would steal, again with his speed, about five, six yards. What are you supposed to do? If you get too close, he gets behind you. If you stand too far away, they're going to throw and steal yards. That's the point. And, that, and that's one of the benefits of, uh, same with like a mobile quarterback. I have reservations about mobile quarterbacks because I think it's just too difficult to be a really good running quarterback and be a really elite passing quarterback. It's just there's too much processing power in the brain that's required. However, there are certain things that make that nearly unguardable. Like we talk, you, you can't play man. I mean, you're going to at times, but as soon as you play man, that quarterback sees that. If there's a lane, you're dead. You're dead. It's over. There goes a 20, 30 yard run easily, at least. So that that is what Watson does. He does he could be the worst wide receiver in the history of the universe, but just by virtue of his speed, it has to open things up. The only other option is to say, nah, I'm not gonna run back there with him. I'm just gonna leave him wide open in the backfield. You have to run back with him, which necessarily stretches out the the field, which means you can work underneath. Aaron says, if we have found it, we win easily 35-20. We flop, I'd go with Mike's score. Mike being 17-10. But don't really know. Plus, is this the beginning of a Rodgers MVP run? Oh, would that be crazy? I mean, who is it right now? It's, it's Mahomes, right? Has to be. I mean, I guess I don't really know what the stats are, but it's the only team that's doing anything, and their offense is really solid. Anyways, he goes on to say, be awful all season, then through diversity, lead this team to a winning record. I can hear it now. Finally, Jason says, I think we can roll with the momentum from that last win. The Packers pull out the victory at home. But given that Tennessee has an absolute horrid pass defense, I would like to see an actual breakout game from Rodgers and the offense utilizing the backs heavily in this game, as well as maybe getting Ture and DeGuara a few touches. I want to see 357 yards and four touchdown performance just for fun. Win with some authority. 100% have to finish drives to make any of that a reality, though. I agree 100%. Final score prediction. I'm just going off the top of the dome here. I don't really know. I'm going to say the Packers win just because why not just keep running with the momentum that everything's going to be all right. Here's the thing, though. If the Packers win, it's because the offense is, is moving. Tennessee does not give up a lot of points. They have not given up more than 20 points since week three, and that was 22 points. I'm going to say 23 points the offense gets. The defense gives up 17. That's what, the, that's what they've scored three weeks in a row. Let's make it four. So 17-23 Packers is my final score prediction. You guys have a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye.